Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. Our guest is Buford Jones. He is a live sound engineer with, I guess, what, about 50 years of experience? 47. I was right at 47 uh, touring. Uh huh. Touring credits, I, I could spend half an hour just listing them, but uh, the highlights, uh, David Bowie, Pink Floyd, Jackson Brown, ZZ Top, Linda Ronstadt, um, pretty much everyone and their mother you've either toured with or at least done one-offs with over the years. And um, part of what's really interesting and I do want to get into with you is the way the technology developed in terms of the stuff you were working on, because you really, you started out in the early seventies. And when you started out, live sound was a completely different world. And we didn't have, we didn't have systems where you could just kind of mix and match, let alone systems where you could shoot the room and figure out where things were going and, and all of that stuff. Everything was kind of cobbled together. And that, that definitely, um, that sort of changed the equation as, as things started developing, I'm sure. But um, that was definitely kind of the well, dark age, wasn't it? It was in a way, in the way that I've got um, involved in it in the beginning. And um, I had a degree in electronics in college. And uh, my dad always told me I should get in electronics. And it looks like he was definitely right. And uh, he bought me a uh, Heathkit radio tube kit. I think when I was about 12 and I put that thing together and so fascinated to hear sound come out of it that uh, it never left. I think that was the beginning uh, of it all. And I always had a fascination for assembling some certain amount of equipment and hear something back from that. Recording was very fascinating to me. Um, I remember in high school, uh, I've been 67, um, of getting Sony's, uh, uh, sound on sound machine. I think it was called a model 252, if I remember right, but sound on sound. And I didn't even know anybody that had that. I didn't even know anyone. I wasn't trying to copy anyone. I somehow stumbled on it and what sound on sound was. And uh, once I did, I, I was as fascinated to the hilt that I could play guitar and play that back and then play something else with it and then hear the both of those and then add something else to it and continue the process. The hell with the tape hiss. It was just a cool process to get into. Oh yeah. You lost a lot of signal there by the end of it all. And the tape hiss was a problem too, but no, the process was just very fascinating. So it, it always got, uh, was very interesting uh, for me and it's a challenge that uh, I enjoyed. So it's like uh, when I uh, actually stumbled in the door at Choco because I say stumbled, uh, a friend of mine had suggested me go there. I did not know where Shoko was. I knew nothing about live sound reinforcement. My dad had, had built some speakers for our church, and that would be the extent of it. And I never even really hooked them up. I just knew that he did it. Uh, so I, I go into Shoko uh, from where a friend recommended me to go visit with them, and I did. And they interviewed me, and they said, you got a college degree in electronics? That's great. You have a studio? That's great. You play an instrument? That's great. And uh, asked me another couple of questions, and they ended with, are you married? And I thought, like, what has that got to do with anything? I'm 21. I <laughs> Yeah, I'm in no rush here. Uh, but then after I did take this job, well, then uh, I realized exactly what that question was, is we're going to send you out on the road with the big suitcase and a box of Tide, and you're not coming home. And uh, that's just exactly the way it was. So I, when they hired me on, I figured I would be doing some bench work because I had been doing that repairing stereos and at another place to make uh, control. Uh, controlling computing devices. And um, so I thought that's what I'd be continuing doing in Shoko. And I did. I soldered the um, connector onto a 27 pair uh, metal and uh, snake and uh, audio snake. And um, then I think I finished it. I think I finished it uh, before in the afternoon that Jack Maxson is one of the owners of Shoko. This is day one that I'm working there. Come in and said, hey, go pack your bags, come back down here, load up this truck, and 
drive this to Atlanta and you'll be on the three dog night tour. Now, mind you, I really didn't know for sure what Shoko did. I, I saw these big speakers that I would love to plug my guitar into, but I, I still knew nothing. Nobody had informed me in a way that uh, I knew. So here I was that night driving a truck to Atlanta and uh, working with Three Dog Night at Atlanta Fulton Stadium uh, was my first gig to walk into. And <laughs> well, no again, pressure. it was a surprise. It was like it wasn't <laughs> something I was hoping for or looking for or it's just where I am. I woke up and here I am here today. So Jack Maxson uh, did an incredible job of mixing three dog night during that stage. And so I'm learning uh, from and with him and uh, just assisting and setting up the equipment. And I always remember that sound that Jack had then. And it was an amazing sound. And it's a sound that I've still tried to emulate to this day. Uh, Floyd Sneed was such a great drummer and he the sound that Jack got on him was just big, fat, and full. I mean, it's not loud or overpowering. It's just like, wow. And uh, everything else was very impressive to me as I heard that. And then uh, the other account that Shoko had at that time, they had two accounts, three, I think, when I walked in. Uh, the other was Led Zeppelin. So Three Dog Night only went out on the weekend at that time. So during the week, uh, yeah, we would do gigs like It's Ice a Beautiful gig. Day, The Kinks, um, The Guess Who, um, ZZ Top, uh, other ZZ Top had not done a full production tour as of yet when I really first met them. And then um, several other groups would do that in the week and then the weekend join back up to Three Dog. Like I said, I spent, I think, 11 months on the road of that first year that I was there. But it was all exciting for a 21-year-old to see the country and uh, driving trucks all night long, late at night. And, uh, you know, so that's what we did at that time. We not only set up the gear and did the show, but we'd strike it, put it in the truck, drive all night long. So I did that for seven solid years of driving the trucks every night after the show. So um, and then got a little... Well, let me back you up a little bit because there's, there's something else that... that plays into yeah. all this you had a musical background too and the musical background obviously i mean that taught that taught you a lot about how absolutely. to listen absolutely I, I, I talk about a lot of my seminars and i didn't realize it's time i do now although i think clearly uh you know then we didn't have a pa my dad played guitar and piano and then uh, I was raised with guitars and pianos all around me because he built them and repaired them. And uh, when I would go home from college, he and I would jam in the garage. And I think that was probably some of his most fun time is me coming home and us jamming. And he taught me to play with my fingers and uh, kind of in a Chet Atkins way because he's a big Chet Atkins fan and couldn't believe that I could figure out a few Chet Atkins songs. So it was, uh, but the, to answer the question, as we're playing, then uh, we didn't play into a PA. Uh, you would set up your amplifier here and another amplifier would be here. And just by sliding your chair a little bit, uh, you know, I can hear both amps. And Something about two, mm -hmm. uh, seemingly in many, many cases, uh, seem to be better than one because now you have uh, somewhat of harmony. Uh, you have uh, a blend, uh, you have a level, you have uh, uh, one piece of music complement another or destroy it another, <laughs> depending on how good you are. <laughs> Uh, but nonetheless, we, we did, and we played a lot, and uh, and that did has stayed with me my entire career. And I believe that um, I believe it it propelled me and through my career. And so I always looked at the mixing console as a instrument. Uh, I I think I, that, probably the first year of Shoko and driving home, what few times I got to drive home, I said this is fun, but this is it. I, I don't like being gone this much. And I really want to play. And um, 
I'd get home and I'd have another assignment and then go back out with somebody else. And it'd always be good. I've, I've never really worked with anybody that did not like their music. There's only been two groups that I can think of that I couldn't understand their music. And it was a little hard for me to uh, figure it out. But everyone else is just like, wow, I've just been so blessed, amazed at who I've worked with and the great music I've heard. So I apply the musical theory to that. And I'm looking for... Uh, blending of things and a good example this is just an example you know when uh, a solo comes up in a mix of a concert of a particular song and you're pushing the solo up and are you're anticipating it and then you ride it on up when it comes in well i figure that there's something else that can enhance that solo just like backing vocals enhance the lead vocal if i can tuck some keyboards up and underneath that guitar solo, I think it makes the guitar solo sound better. Um, or even just bringing up a shaker or something like sure. that. Sure, and just our frequency range texture. there as well. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at a frequency <laughs> boundary. I was, uh, yep. I was, I don't know, it just came along that uh, we didn't have, I started playing with analyzers as they came out. I think the Crown beat up, I think was the first one I had. The Ivy, the little black Ivy, uh, uh -huh. but nah, I wasn't too impressed with that uh -huh. for some reason. I always looked at that as a toy, but, but then again, uh, I would look at them and I would train my ears uh, to sounds when I'm watching the frequency analysis and I and and I learned that over time it took me a long time but uh, it 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 become a tool of mine and that I could recognize frequencies I can't be exact on it but I'm pretty close I've tested myself recently on some sounds I hear some sounds what is this noise I hear a noise you know in my garage it's a constant I said it's about 400 cycles you know and I pull out my phone and I run the analyzer and it's maybe 500. <laughs> so, you know, I, I was close, but where, where is it? What is that noise? So uh, I pretty much after I left Shoko uh, and contracted all my deals through the artist management. And I, I said, I've just loaded enough black boxes. I've, I've done that. I've been there and had enough. And so <laughs> I, I'm at a crossroads. I'll, I'll leave this, what I've done. I've enjoyed what I've done, but if I continue doing it, I'm going to travel with the artist. I'm going to discuss music with the artist. I'm going to discuss the shows with the artist. And I want to do it while it's fresh. I don't want to do it the next day uh, when I see them the next time at sound checks. As a matter of fact, what we do as sound mixers, I cannot believe that that is not the norm. Um, I, 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 I just don't get it sometimes. I really don't. How, And especially in the country field, how engineers, front of house mixers, are also the production manager. They're also the, some of them have three jobs and, you know, they're up at seven o'clock in the morning and, yep. uh, you know, loading gear out of the truck and out there in the hot sun and working all day long. Um, come 12 hours later, getting close to showtime uh, when any normal person would be exhausted then you go and sit down and you mix a live show. Then you actually go to work. That we're out there not just having a show and this is fun and it's a party. We're selling a product. We're selling their album. Uh, all groups. I, I noticed how this uh, procedure would go. And it was us. They would do the record, sp spend however long in the studio that they spent there. And then uh, once the label gets it out, then we're on the road promoting it. I well understood that fact, what we're doing. So we're trying to get people that haven't already bought the album to go buy the album. And uh, you want to give them a good show. You want to give them something to return for. And you also want to give them something that's as close as possible to their signature. But at the same time, with live sound, we could add a little sparkle to the cake and we can, uh, you know, add a little bit in there. But you really don't want to take away, I think, from the original concept of the artist. But there's there's some things we can't do. So that musician thing and then traveling with musicians. And I found that even that riding in the back of the bus after a gig and we're talking and I don't even have to bring up the subject. I can listen to a keyboard player talking to a guitar player and they're just having to say in this song and the bridge, I'm trying to do this figure, uh, you know, locking in with what you're doing. And I will hear that. And, uh, you know, so the next day at sound check, I'm, 
testing that out. Wow, that's cool. Listen to what these two guys are doing in the middle of that. You can't learn things like that from setting up equipment all day in the sun and uh, or wherever it is you do it. And uh, I think it's vital. I, I, I think sound mixers ought to be treated no less than a musician and I'll be paid no less than a musician. And uh, they'd just be part of the touring entourage. Now, most groups, when I, 1980, when I started becoming an independent engineer, um, I had no resistance whatsoever, anybody that called me. And oddly enough, I did not have a resume until 1991 when I moved to Nashville. I put together a short resume, <laughs> actually long, and I quickly shortened it. Wow. But no, I never <laughs> called. I don't think of the 32 multi-platinum artists that I worked for, I can only remember calling one, and that was Don Henley. And I think I would have got that call anyway because I knew a lot of people in that organization and been working with them at that time period, and I think it's 1985. And um, just the phone would ring. I'd get home. There would be, uh, you know, there's a little money in the bank because I'm not here to spend it. <laughs> I'd head right straight to the music store <laughs> and uh, buy, you know, a new microphone, a tape recorder, uh, uh, guitar, or whatever, and uh, get home and just jam. That's all I wanted to do was play and jam when I'm at home. And then the phone would ring. And then it's, uh, hey, this is uh, da -da 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 -da, and David Bowie's going out next week. And, you know, we need you there. And, uh, Oh, okay, right. <laughs> so, well, you know, you put your finger on something though that I think is really important, which is, you know, part of your role or part of the role of any good live mixer, especially, is very much akin with that of a producer in terms of listening and really understanding the big picture of, you know, how does this all come together? And that's so important because I've seen a lot of people, you know, mix a show and it's basically just about you know the overall sound or let's make sure that the kick drum is really sure. freaking loud because we sure. have subs up the wazoo and i think one of the things that's so important is to really approach it like the artist and really understand you know how do these parts fit together how you know um one of the roles that i think a producer really has is the idea of you know let's not have everybody play at once let's Let's have this figure here that the keyboard player is doing fit in with this figure that the guitar player is doing, as you say, and, and really understanding that whole idea of listening to all the parts, both individually and how they come together as a whole. And that's where we really, I think, you know, that's where, as you say, you know, you want to travel with the artist, you want to hang with the artist, because in a sense, you are an intrinsic part yes, of the artistic absolutely, process. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think it was 1976, so I went David Bowie, that Shoko, I was still with Shoko at that time. Uh, uh, Shoko had bought us a uh, Nakamichi 550 cassette machine. And at that time, that machine was serious business mm -hmm. for cassette machine. Yeah, and uh, so I had that stuff, on the yeah. road, and, and uh, of course, with David's permission, and and record the show, and um, you know, I have a great show, everything go well. I had a great band back then. That was Diamond Dogs or Young Americans. I think it's Young Americans, and uh, so it's like uh, I would listen to them in phones uh, in the truck or whatever after the show, and I go like, "Wow, where's the low end that I heard in the room? Where's the bass guitar?" And I never was much for a howitzer kick drum, but I, I do like a big fat kick drum, but not like. <laughs> Uh, mothers do and like to try to impress as a right. kick drum show. Not at but, the expense uh, of the rest of the Where's the kick drum? I just hear a tick, tick, yeah. tick. Well, it didn't take any rocket science. It didn't take me long at all to figure out that, uh, hey, I'm putting too much energy, low end energy into the PA when I tune it, as we do, as a lot want to do, to get this, 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 and uh, you know, all this low end thumping and driving you crazy stuff. I mean, power it's about power and uh so uh you know i i figured that really um i, I listen to this we're, we're, and it just because we would tune a lot with a microphone sometimes and or another cassette at that time period 76 so um you know i and then you wow. you you crank up the bass while you're tuning the pa so that's crossovers you're adding more low end uh, or at the eq on it so 
I uh, started reducing at the crossover. I think Shoko had gone from a two-way into a three-way system. And I, and I just take the low drive and back it down. And I, I, wasn't in, I didn't understand the equal amplitude response for flat response. Most people think that's a bad word. The right word is equal amplitude response. But anyway, whenever I, I would uh, reduce the energy, now it made me go to the console. And for the first time ever, I found myself adding bass to the bass guitar adding it in the range and especially about that time parametric EQ came out. So I could narrow a notch on the bass guitar, find that notch and slide it down. And Ooh, yeah, I got a big bottom on this bass guitar, but I've done it through the console, not the PA. I want the PA to be a flat frequency response. Now that's flat and that's flat. But when we say equal amplitude, well, we we're talking about through every frequency in the same amplitude or voltage. So most of the oh, the human ear doesn't want to hear flat. And, and I don't want to hear anything about any of that. I mean, you got to have a reference. You just got to have a reference. The reference has got to be accurate uh, in the PA system. It's no different than the studio or anywhere else. Uh, they either in a studio, they design the room architecturally uh, to get it as flat as possible. Uh, then uh, they treat it acoustically to do that and if they have to at the end of it all and i think they should or need really need to there's a lot of equalization electronic processing on the end but once i learned to do that my show tapes really really improved and uh that's a huge argument a lot of people especially in the 70s nobody believed you can't listen to show tapes that's not, that's, that's not what's happening there. well it's not but it is close enough if you use a few things and control the stage sound yeah. so that not a whole lot is projecting off the stage you can get very accurate material onto tape and you can take that tape and discuss it the first time that i ever listened to a show tape i think was 77 with linda ronstadt and i had recorded the show and i openly said as much as i was ready to stick the knife in i mean or somebody's going to um I said, uh, I'd like to listen to this with the band to see if we're on the right track. It's my confirmation that I'm doing it right. It's my confirmation that I do have enough guitar with that keyboard. The vocal is sitting where it should, and the background vocals are sitting where it should. It's a much more satisfying experience uh, than it just to be mine. I want it to be all of ours as a touring entourage so i sat with linda ronstadt uh i was in the very center of the u of the back of the bus i was in the very center we had linda ronstadt mind you linda ronstadt sitting here peter asher sitting here and the rest of the band sitting here oh boy so put in the cassette hit play oh boy <laughs> oh boy oh beautiful as the guitar and It'll be there tomorrow night. Uh, it'll be there tomorrow night. It's one of those <laughs> things you don't forget. You don't write it down. Uh, when you're in that sort of a situation and you're listening like that, you don't have to take notes. It, for me, I didn't. It just embedded into me and stayed with me forevermore. And uh, so I you know, like to say, well, you know, this sounds good. The vocal blends are sound good, but you, you've got to make this work. This is a signature part. So these instruments do that. That is priceless knowledge, hearing it directly from the entertainer. Now, most entertainers don't want to do this on a nightly basis. Uh, I have found some that do. Through the rest of my career, through 76 and 77, where I started that, through the rest of my career, I key on somebody in the band. And it's generally the band leader, um, arranger, uh, and and we will, I find that 99% of them do want to listen to some recordings, and uh, we will sit down and analyze these. And that is something I think that kept me solid and that the work that I was doing was the work of the people who paid me to do it. And um, it was just a much better ride and a more thrilling ride. And now when I have a whole challenge, I have my whole sheet of notes. I would try to memorize them, but, you know, things are very important. So once I, the, the notes are really for getting channels muted and unmuted, uh, especially in those days. You, you wouldn't want open channels that didn't need to be open, just contribute 
more noise and ambient noise. So get all of them muted now, now work. And, and I always, always had a thing. Um, I think Don Henry was one of the busiest that I remember. Pink Floyd, I did have help so I could delegate some other responsibilities. But um, no, my, my fingers never leave the faders in a show. I mean, I've, I've looked at a glass of water down on the, by my foot. So I sure want to drink, but no, it's, it's, it's to me like that the whole time. I, it's uh, uh, I'm trying to work with faders around zero. If you can set up your gain structure and then that way subtle moves or one or two DB in a bit. And, and to me, I'm hearing that. And when I've got everything in the pocket, I'm looking yeah. for that water on the floor because I love to have a drink right now. Um. <laughs> but that's your instrument. You're right. And you can't, you know, you can't lift up your fingers any more than if you're on stage doing a keyboard part. You know, you can't go reaching for a drink of water right when you have to be putting that pad in up, or something. Which like most that front of the house engineers and mixers have to deal with is a manager standing over to their shoulder, a producer standing over their shoulder, or a crew member standing over their shoulder. Uh, no telling who, what, <laughs> or a band member's wife, <laughs> whoever may it be, sitting there telling them uh -huh. what to do. You don't do the old trick of keeping an empty channel there for them no, to play I'm with? No, even any of that. I'd put up a <laughs> caution police sign around that console. Uh, that time for me is precious time. Uh -huh. uh, I've had, I think, very firm communication with people around me and then sometimes management to say, hey, when the house lights go down, it's me. I take all responsibility. Now, if I'm not doing something right, I'll talk to you for the other 22 hours of the day. I will. I'll talk to you all you want. But this showtime, don't talk to me. Even though I know that you might have a good point, mm -hmm. but I'll be willing to listen to it later. And the point goes to make that clear to you. If you have a point, why don't you walk up on stage right in the middle of the song and go tell a guitar player that if he capoed and played a different formation up here, that song may sound neater. You know, that's, that's something good to know. It's cool, but you got to tell me now. And so it's a good I, analogy. I, Absolutely. I get really turned off by that. And uh, don't interrupt me. I, I, I lose my, you're on kind of a roll. Uh, and, and, and it's like I said, there's this procedure and procedure you're trying to anticipate a bit, but also keep things going there. And uh, that was, a, that was a, one of my, I think, finer points to be able to do. And uh, one of the house lights went out. It's an intense hour and a half, uh, just, just staying up with it. And um, as things got bigger now, also now we add producers into this, which is another mystery to me. I have met three or four producers that gave me input on the road. And uh, I really appreciate it. Greg Ladani is a great friend. Uh, so sorry of his passing. And I respected Greg's word. Greg was one that really couldn't explain a console to you, but he could make it sound good. He would find the knob whatever it was to get what he wanted out of something well uh i started working with him in 1980 with jackson brown and and uh and i thought it too is unique of jackson to have me come out during the final stage of mixing the album in the studio and and i was just free to roam just free to roam and i'd walk around and listen and watch what they're doing and uh that was brilliant. That's just absolutely brilliant on his part that I could absorb a lot of what was going on in the final stages of this album and take that into production rehearsals a few weeks later. That's a great point. That's really a great point because that's what you're that's what you're trying to do. You're trying it, it's not that you're trying to reproduce the album live, but what you're trying to do is bring that same that same magic, whatever it is, that artist's vision. You're responsible for bringing that out night after night in a live setting. And if you're not in touch with that artist, not just in terms of being their engineer, but really, you know, simpatico with their vision, then you're not going to do That's the right. job that you were really hired to do. In and Greg, sense. too, would come out on the road, say, for the first uh, week or two. 
uh, he did that on a couple of Jackson tours, uh-huh. and uh, I can tell he's really having fun. He 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 liked that atmosphere as well. Now he's got a big audience around him instead of being enclosed in a studio. Now he's got a big audience, and they're responding. And this is fun. Yeah, now you're getting feedback. Now you're getting in, you know because that's the thing about creating in the studio is you know you're you're in this bubble. And, you know, it's like an artist painting a picture. Eventually that artist is going to put that picture out there and it's going to get feedback, but you're not getting that same feedback that, that you're getting, that the artist is getting being out there in front of the people and getting the He would put response. quite a load on me, but I, I liked it. You know, it's, I like the challenge, you know, like taking a little mm-hmm. Lynn drum machine when they first come out and taking every input, every output of the LEN machine back into the console. So I had 12 or 16 inputs from the LEN alone. Uh-huh. And I go, wow, I mean, surely they can give me a stereo mix. I mean, surely, you know, no, 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 no. And, and, and it was fun to have all the different control, but Greg would stay there for the first <laughs> week, week or so. And then I could tell you, he said, man, you got this down. He said, I, I won't stay longer, but he said, you got it under control. I was like, well, all right, well, cool. And thank you for showing me what you did. And uh, Peter Asher usually would come mm-hmm. out with me the first week or so on Linda's tours in the 70s. And uh, he would sit out there and listen. And and again, he was really, I, I think he wanted me to express myself to a degree, but stay with course within the signature of Linda's music. But, uh, you know, he would point out the hooks. He would point out uh, things that just the blends, that these things must be in there. And then uh, after that would settle down after yeah. about a week, and then he'd go up to play tambourine on stage. And <laughs> I remember one of those listening to show tapes uh, was, I don't know, it was a frequency response to the tape deck, uh, cassette deck, but said, where's the tambourine? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. This man is fundamentally <laughs> writing my check. I, you know, we better get that tambourine in his mix. So, um yeah, that was a very important point. But Peter was always great about he. He was just Peter's wonderful. Yeah, I, I i had the I had the honor of 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 uh, seconding a session for him many many years ago. And he's one of the things that he's got that I think is really important is that that understanding of listening, of really listening, and you know not not interjecting feedback or, of any kind until you really kind of understand the artist's vision and as you say how all that stuff blends and that's that's yes, so important man. yes it is so that was a, a big thing for me in uh, my career and then playing that music and uh, wow what nights I look back and some of them I can't believe it I, I just can't uh, I wish I could bring those moments back some way and even you know when we look at some videos and YouTube stuff with some concerts back when and you know, well, yeah, that's cool. I was there or whatever, but it's like, no, it, it's just not the feeling that you had when you were there and uh, have a little piece of it. No, the magic they is, feel, the magic I, is I in, the, in the event. Yeah. Out of my heart, uh, running back into the dress room after a good show and, and, um, uh, she was so cool to work with. And I, I just love going in there and, and a couple of times tell her, Thank you for letting me have a little piece of your show, a little piece of your career, a little thing that I got along. I said, that means everything in the world to me. And uh, she was wonderful with that. And and uh, Pink Floyd, to give you another example. Now, it, this is after Roger Waters had left the band, but I remember the first week that uh, of rehearsals of six weeks of rehearsals at a hangar at Air Canada, Toronto International Airport. And it's my third day, and I was timing uh, the intervals of an echo on the song Us and Them so I could apply that echo, uh, you know, set that in my DDL and be able to uh, use it. So, and David Gilmore was just strolling around. This is in the afternoon sound check, and he'd come out the console and said, Hey, what you doing? I says, Oh, I'm just getting this like the record. I said, I'm, I'm timing the echo for it for us and them and uh, trying to get that right. He was Buford. You don't have to treat this like that. Um, no, I remember the exact quote. I went, but he says, you don't have to do it exactly like the record. He says, be an artist and paint this picture however you want to paint it. And I was, wow, I could feel a tremendous load drop off my shoulder. 
uh, I, you know, it's quite a thing to be sure. at Pink Floyd's front of house console for the first time. And, uh, you know, you being like, wow, I know if I make one mistake, I'm out of here. One mistake, yeah, yeah, I, I might be allowed to, but the one, you're going to be out of here. And for him to say that to me, be an artist and paint a picture, I knew exactly what he meant. He, he wasn't saying, sit out here and, you know, get loaded and, you know, <laughs> just do whatever you want to do. Uh, it stay within the Pink Floyd's signature. But, hey, you've been doing this for years. You've got some something to offer, too, and I want it. So put it in. Uh, he's, that's what he was saying, be an artist. And add in to the picture what you feel it needs. And that gave me tremendous liberty. And, I, you know, I, I did not copy every album song, every song off the album, like it was on the album, particularly with effects. You know, I, uh, some that I felt were vital to that song, of course, most some of them. Some, if I just thought it sounded good, they added live and it was dry on the record or whatever, I would do that. Well, it's the same reason that a, it's the same reason that a, that an artist picks, you know, one producer to work on an album, and then maybe they'll go with a different producer for a different album because they want your artistic input as well. You know, you're part of the creative yes. process. Yes. And I think that's, that's very critical too, um, which leads me to another thing that, that is really interesting because you've been, doing this for so long you know how the creative process has changed from technology you know for example in 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 the recording studio you know we we have gone from you know uh from multi-track tape to digital workstations we've gone from overdubbing to the ability to undo everything to a rack of gear that can now fit into a laptop all of that has changed the creative process for how artists work in the studio. And the same evolution happened to live sound. You know, we went from, from I mean, I know you were one of the first people to mix in stereo. You know, we went to the, the idea of line arrays and, you know, in-ear monitors, which changed the whole sound on the stage and, you know, being able to, to voice a room and stuff like that. How has that influence your work and change what you well, do you know not not a whole lot really i mean when, when it comes down to particularly the show itself and mixing the show itself but uh equipment has changed tremendously uh, since i started uh and i, I hear some people make comments uh, that have been around a long time and they'll talk about how bad things sounded in the early 70s and uh I'll tell you what, uh, I, I don't know if I agree totally with that. And uh, any more so than the old phonograph record didn't sound very good. Uh, we know it's amazing sound uh, out of some home systems that were on vinyl. So uh, it's like uh, when it was full analog. Now, uh, the equipment we had then, I think, was just smaller on um, power and not able to cover as long areas, line arrays brought us in projection and be able to uh, go further. Uh, but we we're talking about speakers here for a moment, but um, no, I, I I heard some pretty amazing Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd, I mean, uh, Free Dog Night Show. Absolutely. Now, the, the uh, sure, absolutely. When digital came in, there was always the argument there, and uh, it was sustained for quite a while, it seems like, and several of us were reluctant, including myself, to jump to a digital consoles, only because I know it's a computer, and we had already had computer experience, this type of computer experience, and uh -huh. this crashes. And oh, it, they, it always crashes at the worst time. The computer crashing is just mm -hmm. an element we didn't want to add to live. You know, this is... Uh, no, no, it, it does give me a lot more flexibility. It gives me uh, a choice or more choices than I've ever had and uh, a freedom to be able to re recall things, uh, which is unheard of in the 70s. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of new flexibility here. And so it took me a while. And once I jumped in, uh, it was Digico that I was first introduced to that I, Bob Dole, sorry, uh, had... Uh, uh, he gave me a demonstration uh, of it, of the Digico. And I said, wow, this is laid out in a manner that it 
looks analog, uh, meaning that I can sit down and think that I'm in the analog world. And I think this is, I don't know. There was something that said, okay, I'm, I'm ready to try this. And, and uh, uh, so went into that. And, and I had good experiences. I, I, I did not have, thank goodness, a meltdown or shutdown in the middle of the show uh, with that. As, uh, but at the same time, I, I noticed all this additional flexibility. And that flexibility made up for the analog digital quality sound, quality d- discussion. Well, I can do more. Right. The, the idea of having a compressor on every channel, for example, did that change the way you worked at all? Well, the Paragon, ATI Paragon had compressors on every channel. It was the first console that I remember that uh, did do that. And, and that was still in the analog domain. So I thought that was brilliant uh, uh-huh. that I could have signal processing on every channel. And I'm not shy on processing. I, I, so mm-hmm. it was something that, yeah. I, I, I liked using, but uh, the other consoles now, uh, I, 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 I'm not quite, I don't get to feel, I guess maybe somebody that feels a guitar, a fine guitar, so not only as you play it, you feel the quality that lies underneath, inside it, and, and the digital consoles, uh-huh. it just seems like to me a yet another way of Plinking, and then we got too many screens plugged in, and I'm I'm guilty of that. I love to have that. that this this surround sound <laughs> of screens, and uh, you know, where to me at that uh-huh. point you're mixing with your eyes and not your ears. You know, we're we're watching all of these screens all around us. You get buried in that. At Belmont University, I was trying to really encourage the students. You know, use those tools when you need them, which really a primarily a sound check and what have you. But when it comes to showtime, you know, put that out, mix with your ears. It's your ears. And, um, it's your ears, man. Yeah. The ears are the most important tool. And follow Absolutely. that out. And, and, and then you, you, you begin to groove with it. I remember uh, was two years ago, we would do uh, concerts where we'd work with the students of Belmont at, at Curb Center there in Nashville and Belmont students that are studying music would be the musicians. And then Belmont students that are studying technology would set it all up. And then some local vendors would bring in some equipment. It's great. What a wonderful learning experience for somebody at university. And I'm so happy to be a part of that and go down with these people and I work with them. And then in, in lectures, talk about them, actual experiences of things that that worked for me, that kept me working for 47 years. I don't know if it's right or wrong. I'm just telling you, something kept me working for 47 years. So uh, they seemingly really to like to hear that. And uh, and I, I'm watching one mixer, and I'm trying to share these kind of experiences with them. And I'm watching one mixer one night. It's 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 an open concert. There's, it, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people come to it. They're not advertised. Only families come to them. But I noticed the mixer who I'd been working with, been in my class, and I was just watching him. And, and during the show, as I said, it's a no-no. I don't talk to anybody. I don't want anybody talking to me. And I tell them, don't talk to anybody. Just mix this show, start to finish. And uh, I noticed he was really groovy. I could see his foot patting there for a while. And after a while, it started shaking. He's got a little dance going on. I'm going, all right, he's into it. He's into it. Okay. He, he's, he's got the background. He knows what else to do. But I noticed him really dancing with the music. And it sounded good. So I knew he was on the right track. And whenever it stopped, the, the artist finished their three songs or whatever it is they played. I went right up to him. I could tell he was really excited. A couple others were brushed up to tell him he did a great job. And I says, you did a great job. But I said, look, while you got this excitement, go right backstage and share that with the artist. And he kind of looked at me and said, what? I said, go back there and just tell them it sounded great out front. How else do they really know if you don't tell them? And he did that. And uh, he was really excited. He told me later at the next class, he says, wow, I went back there. We had a blast. And, and he said, yeah, they really enjoyed the show and he says now they call me up whenever they do local gigs they call me up to mix it and i go well you know that's just how it works that's as simple as how it works if you share these experiences and you're putting this together in a collective effort 
it you'll have you'll have work you'll have work people will want you around when they notice that passion and desire in you and when you have a good show that was my case on many countless nights when i'd have a great show you no know, as soon as i'd shut that console hit the mute button i'm off to the dressing room sometimes i get to the dressing room before the band did and uh you know, and just to tell them, wow, it's great what you did. Da, 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 da. Your mic technique tonight was wonderful. Your voice was really full. It looked like you were really enjoying yourself and uh, whatever. Uh, I think to tell an artist that communication is extremely important, that you, you're not just like, oh, you're the greatest thing I ever heard. You're the best man there ever was and all of this. Well, you know, it's when you start detailing it. It's a peer-to-peer -peer communication. It's it's and it's the same thing that a lot of producers do in the studio. And I think it's so important too because it builds a certain trust. And when you're when you're working with anybody in a creative environment, whether it's doing a live show or whether it's creating the record in the studio, creating that trust between you and the artist, where the artist knows that you feel what they're doing, that you really get what's behind it. And I think what you're talking about really does that because it, it creates this communication between you and the artist where you're really, you have this bond and that bond is just, that's priceless. There's nothing better than that. And, and as you say, I mean, there's, there's so many parallels between the live show and the record and creating the record because you're creating a live experience for people and, you know, having that trust with the artist, that's just, I think that's, as you say, that's why you get called back. I, I think in 1980, when I made that decision, it's the best decision I ever made. I could have stayed at Shoko till they sold out. I probably could have had a pretty high-end position in Shoko. I, I think I had a career there. I, I left on good terms. I, I just decided that this is what I want to do. And, and it's chancy. You know, at Shoko, I had a paycheck in the mailbox every two weeks. Every two weeks, there's a check in the mailbox. Whereas when you're independent, you only get a check in the mailbox when you're touring. And when it stops, all income stops. So that frightens some. And uh, they would rather maybe working for a sound company. But I always felt that that limited me. Uh, you know, if I work for a sound company, uh, I don't want to be restricted from somebody that that just need somebody good to mix their music. And I'll go with any sound company, you know, that, that's fine by me. So, and, and in fact, I hear a lot said from time to time, well, I chose so-and-so for this tour or sound mixer, or I picked so-and-so for this tour. I don't think you did. I'm sorry, but I don't think you did unless you wrote the check. And now if you wrote the check, <laughs> then fine, you got what you got. But I know well enough how the politics go in this business and as well as the pricing and the budgeting and the sound engineer doesn't pick the group. Uh, of all the 32 platinum artists that i worked for, I think I've had it twice asked, narrowed it down, who do you want? But uh, no, it doesn't work that way. So, and, and, and it's a benefit. It's a benefit. To me, it was. Now, some that would quit a solid job at a sound company and try to go independent, I don't recommend that. I'm not recommending that. I'm just saying I did that, and it worked out extremely well for me. So here, I, I didn't have any direct affiliation with any sound company. I worked with several, two or three tours, uh, whatever, what have you. But, uh, yeah, this opened it up. So I, I love getting a call, and, uh, you know, uh, wow, that's artist another great artist and uh, yeah i want to be there and i uh, sure sure i'll go do it and uh sometimes uh you know working with uh, different companies i think all have a good staff and and the staff has propelled me through the years i mean these guys i think they know me and they've always uh know of me when they come to work with me and they always treat me with respect and i really appreciate that and sometimes i think you can be a little overwhelming or more so than they think they they, they will go to uh, a much larger extent to try to keep me satisfied than needs to be. And uh, nah, I can give some examples later, but I'm meaning that, uh, yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, I want your input. I, I love at the end of the night to hear what uh, my tech or somebody that's working with me, what they thought about the show and uh, their comments on it. And I certainly uh, pick up on the comments of somebody who's truly listening when it's like, wow, that echo that you had on the so-and-so, man, you didn't have that on there last night or something. And you, you, you tried that on there. It sounded incredible. I go, wow, you're listening. 
And and that to me is what it's all about is listening. So I've been in three, maybe four situations, maybe more, I don't know, of tours that I've had to leave for whatever reason. And they wanted me to help them find a person to take my seat. And in many cases, my selection of that is not who has the longest track record, not who has the longest resume, but who has the most passion. And in many cases, it's been guys that assisted me in my uh, my mixing. And, uh, you know, I, and when they make comments like that, I go, wow, Makes sense. you'll you'll fit. You, you'll do this. You know, you get it. You get it. And uh, so yeah. I say yeah, this you to the artist, yeah. they go, well, he doesn't have a lot of, you know, credits and credentials. I said, well, I understand. But I said, I think he's going to do a great job. And they, mm -hmm. all my suggestions have been hired and all my suggestions stayed with those artists <laughs> for quite some time. So that's, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Just trying to prove the point that passion and love of music will propel you through this with excitement. And it makes it, I mean, 47 years on the road, nine passports filled up. I, I you know, I traveled more than I really wanted to. And after a while, it, I just become numb to it. You know, I, I you know, well, Thursday, I'm at the airport and going to wherever in Germany or wherever in Japan or whatever. Just go. You're going to play and go. Uh, don't really think about it. Just go. And, uh, you know, it, it just, after a while, it, it just weighed on me enough to where I realized after I had, uh, complete this 47 years and then i was in at meyer sound at that time and i figured this might reduce my, my amount of traveling which it didn't do it at all in fact i think it almost increased it and uh when i first joined meyer sound i was still mixing the counting crows and clint black and and uh the three were overwhelming those two bands and and uh meyer sound was overwhelming so i made the choice i got to stop the touring live sound mixing and dedicate myself to this incredible job in Meyer Sound. So that's what I did. And uh, I told Helen Meyer, I said, I'd like to give you a hundred percent of my time. And she thought it was good that I still had my hands into the field at that time while working with them, which I think was good too. But it was, as like I said, it, it was just overwhelming. Sure. So after a time I, I uh, stopped touring the Counting Crows, the last band I mixed was 2000. Seven to eight, two thousand eight, and uh, yeah, I think I think that's the date. And it was very emotional for me because I knew it. They didn't know it. They didn't know anything about it. I, I just made a statement to them that I was I, I, I wouldn't be here anymore, and I was going to take on this other job. And that night, after mixing the show, and it's a good show in San Jose, California. I always remember because I went back in the dressing room to say goodbye to them, and. Uh, it was, it was pretty emotional for me. Uh, like I said, they had no idea. <laughs> you kind of seem a little whatever, Buford. And I thought, well, you know, 47 years, and this is my last show. And I know it. I know it when I'm doing it. And uh, it was tough. It was kind of tough to walk away from it. But I walked into a wonderful thing. What a great exit to walk into Meyer Sound and, and still be in the live sound world but just kind of in a different uh, position and uh, did that for the following 15 years. So it was, um, I've been blessed. I've been absolutely blessed and very thankful. Yeah. I mean, you picked a, you picked a good company to, to sign on with as far as especially being on the cutting edge of a lot of the technological developments. I mean, you know, I've, I've sat, I've sat at lunch with John Meyer and, uh, you know, you have a conversation with that man and you better just hang on for dear life and buckle up because he's a he's an absolute just font of yes. knowledge. Yes. No question about it, you know. Um, but I think also, you know, you got a good point there about wanting to stay involved somehow, you know, because because it really does. It, it makes a difference being able to to put it into practice. And especially because, you know, one of the things that you have made clear is that for you it's not just about the technology of mixing a show it's about really being involved with the artist and being involved with yeah. the creative yeah. process the, the the creative process that goes yeah. behind putting a show together and everything i mean that i think is what makes a 
the huge, the, I the biggest difference. I think to every audio publication that exists since, and some from Europe, I, I get some to come from Europe uh, since early seventies, mm -hmm. and I was fascinated by them. And uh, they, these things would stack up. I'd either <laughs> keep them various places in the house, either by the toilet, but the uh, nonetheless, I, 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 that was always fascinating to see the new equipment. But it seemed like once I exited. Uh, well, no, I, I, no, I'd say fully retired from our sound. It's of interest for me, but no, it's not like it was, you know. Uh, you see, when I'd see something in a magazine years ago, I just wanted to get my hands on it. <laughs> yeah, that's yep. all. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, my wife used to call it. My yeah. wife used to call it gear porn. You know, and the the latest the latest, latest issue of Mix is here, so she knows what I'm doing for the next hour. You know, that kind of thing. But now uh, there's only a couple of publications that I still keep or go online now and do. But uh, you no, know, it's it's golf every day now. I I didn't know what I was going to do when I retired, but uh, yeah, I just moved into a community that has a golf course in it, and and. Uh, I'm just pretty much, I'm playing with the seniors group up there. And uh, these guys are older than me. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you what, I, I watched them hit the ball and they've got such a different stroke. And uh, <laughs> I can't hit anywhere near what you guys hit. i tell you what, man. I Yeah, I, I tried golfing with, with guys, but, you know, I mean – I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just me, man, but the ball's too small for the court, you know? But, uh, no, I, I play a little bit in my studio. I'm in my <laughs> studio now. Uh, it's, it's just the smallest setup I've ever had, but uh, that's what I'm doing with it now. So I still jam. I take MIDI files and I, and I just build them up, you know, try to get them to sound the way I'd like to hear them sound and then jam guitar with it. And that's where it stays. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go to anybody or nothing. But so that's my touch of music now. And uh, it's just that creative standpoint and, and wanting to play. I always wanted to play. And, and uh, you know, it, all through the years, as I said, even before I got involved with Life Sound Touring, I was playing. And uh, when I get home, I'd buy all this equipment. And uh, it seemed like this grew and grew and grew. And I had a massive amount of studio equipment, but never home long enough to understand it. And enjoy it. And in fact, I would enjoy get home it. and uh -huh. I would have this massive yep. layout that would take me 20 minutes to initialize it, to get everything turned on and working because I'm so OCD that everything, no matter if I'm going to use it or not, has to be plugged <laughs> in and working. So, and, I, and I do that. And I know I never that use problem. Stuff, yep. And then by the time I, you know, get it all turned on and working, I've already forgot what I went down there for it. Or if I had a groove on my mind, I've forgotten it. Uh, so it's it's funny that when I look back that I never <laughs> really I, I knew any of my studios and figured it out. So now this is very simple now. I'm in stereo only and no surround anymore. And, and uh, you know, just to shorten it up, just the basics. And and I'm, I'm still having fun with it. So I do love to play. And uh, that's what I'm doing with it. You know, you're keeping your hand in and you're keeping, you're keeping yourself involved in the creativity. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's, that's why you got into it in the first place, right? That's why that's, I think for, for most of us, that's why we got into it is for a well, lot of music. Particularly too now, else, right? uh, uh, is houses of worship that I've been involved in and, and some through my sound, uh, I was initiated to that, but uh, I am. I try to walk the walk of a Christian, and I, I, uh, uh, I've gone to a couple of churches there in Dixon, where I live, which is about an hour and a half from here, and then a couple that I'll go to here, and of course, all of which I somehow end up at the console. <laughs> in, in many cases, I'm on a compliment. I'm not there to cut them down, but you know, it's it seems like I'm going there to hear a message is what I'm going there for. I'm not going there to make their sound system sound good. But to me, that's that's just got to be a horrible thing. I mean, uh, what could be more important than to hear the Word of God spoken by the pastor and not be able to hear it because of technical problems or it be so shrill or so uh, loud in many cases or whatever that it is distracting and takes away from the whole 
purpose of you being there. So I, I was almost considering starting a little business where I would uh, post something and uh, I'd like to go to different uh, churches. Denomination doesn't matter to me uh, because I see this problem exists quite heavily. And it's mainly because many of them have the adequate equipment, but it's volunteers that run it. And it's, it, they're, they're perfectly capable capable, but they just haven't had the experience. So uh, it's in most cases that I've been in, and I've been in quite a few, and I'm called by several churches, but uh, it's just that. It's kind of laying it out, taking out what they have, showing them a little bit different way and setting it up that it will be come out and, and you will, you'll, you'll be more productive with that. And uh that's been very satisfying for me now. You know, a lot of those, a lot of those churches also, the, the other challenge that they have is that a lot of those, especially the older ones, the acoustics are designed for, you know, making the choir sound great, making the organ sound great. And when you start getting into somebody actually speaking, the speech intelligibility goes down. That's why, you know, the, the steer to raise, for example, are such a big thing in a lot of these, uh, in a lot of these spaces, because it really does come down to just, as you say, you have inexperienced operators, and then on top of that, they're fighting acoustical environments that are not conducive to really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. getting that word out there. So it's a, yeah. So I think you know that's that's that, that's another yeah. way you can come yeah, in. Yeah, really I've really been enjoying doing that, that. and I'm, I'm seriously thinking about starting a website or something and and just stating on that. No charge. I, I, you know, if I had to go back or several times and it needs something, that's fine. But to go and evaluate a sound system and, and give them a report and then say, take this or, or leave it or whatever. But uh, that's going to be my main focus if I understand. And then uh, every word uh, clearly that is spoken. And uh, it's not really making the, the band sound good which that's nice too uh and we want to but the spoken word there's no excuse for that and then i'm, I'm finding they just vary in so many different ways and now you have so many different age groups you have the entire age range and you know as as with concerts yep. what always kind of you know nobody really ever asked the audience how did you like the show you know you, you, we compare it between our colleagues and our uh you know people that we would work in the industry how shows done it but how many go out and ask the audience Stop you know, or poll yeah. the audience i did this once and i i found it extremely interesting on jackson brown tour again where after catering you know we usually have an hour before the show starts and so i would go out and i had a little spiral notebook and i don't know where i came up with this idea it's just something to do really fill time you know and uh and i go out to the console and i get a little spiral notebook you know and people are starting to come in and sit in different areas you know spread out and i walk up only to couples and i'd say hello and and i'd show my pass i said i work for jackson and i said yeah, this, is, this is not official at all but I, I, i'm just saying would you write down five songs that you hope jackson is going to be playing tonight and go, yeah sure you know mm -hmm. so let me write this down. And I don't even look at it. I flip the page. I go sit down with somebody else. I said, so I get about three or four of these a night. And, uh, you know, this, after, after three or four weeks, well, it started building up. I don't know. I'd have 30 entries or so. And, uh, of course, Dr. Buys is going to be number one on there, running on empty right on right there. But then, of course, there's going to be several occurrences of the, of the same song that he hasn't been playing. Oh, I find that interesting. I don't know if anybody else does, but I find it interesting. This is what the audience wants. This is what the people want that are coming to see you play. And uh, so I took it back in the dressing room. I always remember, and I took it to Russ Conkle first, the drummer, and I showed it to Russ. And Russ thought, wow, this is amazing. And, and he said, this is really amazing. And you see everybody's different handwriting. And da, 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 da. What songs are we here? I, I can just hear Russ saying it too. Yeah. He says, Have you showed this to Jackson yet? And I says, No. And I, I was intended to. And then uh, I don't know if it's one of those days. <laughs> Maybe Jackson had a little bit too much on his mind or something. But I remember walking it over to him and he looked and he kind of thumbed through it and just kind of handed it back to me. You know, he really didn't have a comment. And Jackson was always cool about playing songs for people when they request one. And, uh, 
So I thought, oh, I bet there's one on the list here that you haven't played. But I think maybe it was a thing. But if you see my point, what I'm talking about is really taking a poll of the people who listen, how they enjoy the concert. I think this should be graded. I quite actually, it's a website I wanted to start a long time ago, was if you go to a concert, you go in and and if you want to, and you will, and, and you fill out a short questionnaire. You know, how was the sound? Was it too loud, not loud enough? You, were you satisfied with the money that you spent for the concert? Da, 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 da. What did you like most about the concert? Blah, 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 blah. Make it short and easy. And then and now let that accumulate. I would think uh-huh. record companies and management companies would be thrilled to see that and to know what it is. But who who you tell me, who asked the audience? I mean, other than a friend that comes down and does is great, but I'm talking about the majority of people that are listening there. And the same in Houses of Worship. we got such a spread age group here. You know, you can't have a loud, powerful band. You, you, you just, so the young people love it. The old people can't deal with it. And they'll actually leave the church. I see that many times. And they get the terminology mixed up that, the sound ran me off. No, it wasn't the sound. <laughs> it was, it was, it was the music. It was the, it was the uh, performance. Well, you know, there's some of some of these churches that have um, like a separate youth chapel, for example, because you know they're going to have the, they're going to have the electric, you know, the the uh, amplified band in you know playing for the youth chapel, and then they might have you know a more traditional kind of thing for. Uh, for yeah. the the oldsters, so to speak, you know, I think that's um, you know, you're giving people what they want because, as you say, there's for all these churches now, there's a whole lot of different forms of worship. There's a whole lot of different, yeah. you know, they're well, they're all valid. So, well, what else did you have in mind? We're we're uh, we're hour fifteen now. Yeah. No, we're good, man. We're good. I appreciate it, Buford Jones. Thank you for being my guest. Quite welcome. Nice seeing you again, Dan. Have a great night. Been a pleasure. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.